and uh, welcome to the Anthropocene, uh, a period in which humans, defined by uh, humans significantly altering the geology and biology of the world. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I go along, but mostly I'm talking about what we're doing at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, uh, looking, uh, doing research on human alteration of the environment for the purpose of informing public policy. The Smithsonian Institution is not interested in actually writing policy. Okay, this thing does not work. In Maryland, we had a hotly contested uh, uh, election for governor in which a real estate developer was elected uh, our new governor. And one of the platforms he ran on was get rid of the rain tax. This is actually called the stormwater tax, kind of given several names. But basically, it's a special tax to raise money to implement stormwater uh, retention and other sorts of systems that keep uh, water from flowing directly into the Chesapeake Bay, which increases sediment loads and nitrogen loads and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so uh, it was hotly contested, and, and the rain tax became one of those catchwords, which is a really uh, 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 mischaracterization. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about two projects we've done where we look at uh, specifically erosion and sedimentation demonstrating in part that there is, in fact, a stratigraphic marker for the Anthropocene, despite what some geologists think. And we're going to look at two sites very quickly. Port Tobacco, which is in the southwestern part of the state, uh, down in Charles County, and then actually on the campus of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, south of Annapolis, some 2,600 uh, 2, acres. At Port Tobacco, you can see in the topographic map, it's circle in red. And I've got a line running through there that shows uh, the, the section below that shows exaggerated the topography. Port Tobacco sits on the floodplain of Port Tobacco Creek at the base of some fairly high, high uplands that have been cultivated since the early 18th century. In 1945, a very smart uh, geographer named Gottschalk uh, produced these two models, the top one being of Port Tobacco Creek, and you can perhaps see Port Tobacco is right here. He recreated that model, and I've modified it, this isn't exactly his, but Port Tobacco hasn't moved, but the creek has. All filled with sediment, and ob here's the uh, obvious uh, sources of that sediment. He said 1862 because he had a, a map, a U.S. Army map from that period. Archaeological research at Port Tobacco suggests that the sedimentation problem happened a century earlier, essentially choking off the source of wealth for this community because it was a port town. They could no longer get ships there. Uh, just a view of what the town looked like, uh, very unusual for Southern Maryland. In fact, it was a town with all sorts of businesses and law offices. Uh, the buildings in red indicate the surviving historic structures, and I'm going to focus on this one down here called the Birch House, uh, which dates to the 18th century. You can see in this topographic map, we've got these uplands here. I've put these blue lines in here showing the gullies. So we've got an immense amount of material eroding down, cutting through uh, those deposits and redepositing in what's essentially an outwash fan uh, at the base of uh, the uplands and east of where the creek at least used to be. And we've done a fair number, a uh, fair bit of excavation around Birch House. And I'm going to focus quickly on two units, initially over here on this side of the Birch House and then here on the upland side of the house. Uh, you can see uh, Kelly Walter here now of the Archaeological Conservancy excavating. We've got a post hole and mold that intrudes into a post hole. Both of these are more than three feet below current grade. Uh, these are all wash deposits that have flowed in over the last couple of hundred years. And at the other side of that same excavation, you can see the, the, the profile here. This is all material that's washed in. Shows up better in our drawing here. 
you know, we've got a nice dark soil here, burned and crushed oyster shell here, and a buried egg horizon here, and yet another post hole. Uh, you might barely be able to make out where the builder's trench for the existing building cut through these deposits. That's a lot of material over a short period of time. On the other side of the house, an excavation unit that <laughs> uh, encountered one of our old shovel test pits. We got tired of digging that shovel test pit. We just kept hitting gravels before the project really began. And we had no understanding of the geology. We thought, oh, it must be some sort of cut and fill sort of thing. Well, in fact, what we've been digging through was material that washed down the slope. And we gave up uh, a little bit. So here's the bottom of the shovel test pit. Here's a buried 18th century horizon. And you can see here a gully created by some of the uh, uh, r flood waters rushing through, and of course, all sorts of re re redeposition. And just to view of that same unit, you can see that buried A horizon here, nasty, clunky, gravelly soil up top. Uh, the natural A horizon here and B horizon, no rock whatsoever. This is all upland material that's been redeposited. In this case, again, about three feet worth. Okay, it's Smithsonian, located here. Uh, and, uh, Annapolis, the state capital is just above it. It's about 20 minutes away. We're working around the uh, Selman house, a house uh, occupied by the same family from about, uh, well, the site was, from 1727 until they sold it in 1916. And after that, the, uh, uh, another family until CERC acquired the property just a few years ago. So we're really looking at the effects and decisions of two families uh, over uh, a considerable period of time. We've got an 1841 house that has an 18th century addition to it. Isn't that interesting? And add a 20th century addition to that. Well, this 18th century structure is part of a building that's no longer there. It was replaced in 1841. We know 1841 because the quality control guy left his name and date on a rafter, uh, making it easy for us. Beneath the 1841 building, we have a massive masonry, stone masonry foundation that really doesn't relate to the building above it. So we know that there was a large 18th century house here, and only the addition to it survives. So at some point, that original 18th century house had to be dismantled. And I suspect that's the beginning of some of the problems we see in terms of erosion uh, in the course of our research. So here we have a topographic map. Uh, everything here is in metric because it's the Smithsonian, and that's what we do. Uh, here's the 1841 building, 18th century edition, and our lab, a 1979 edition. Close interval shovel testing all around the house lot, uh, recording uh, deposits as well as artifacts, uh, including down the hill across the road along what used to be a spring-fed stream and no longer exists. It's all filled with sediment. And in these units, we found deeply buried deposits, which I'll get back to in just a moment. So looking at distributions of artifacts, just lumping together all the architectural artifacts uh, by weight, I think, with this particular one, you know, we have an obvious cluster around the building complex, uh, another cluster over here, and then we have another site down here which causes this distribution. But clearly there's a building here. We did uh, some testing with a couple of one meter by one meter units, and you can see the foundation uh, brick foundation on the right and a drawing of it on the left. That brick foundation is all three courses high. Now you can't support any kind of building on three courses of brick. Presumably we've lost a lot and yet that brick started just below the sod. So we've lost a lot of material here around what used to be a building. And I suspect this building was a temporary um, structure occupied by the family while the new house was being built in 1840 or so. We also have this driveway, which is clearly automotive. It comes, it's not part of the 18th century design, approaches the house at an angle. And you can just imagine folks driving up and down this thing for a number of years, causing this erosional problem before somebody decides, let's pour some concrete and try to arrest that erosional problem. But before they did, they lost a total of about four feet of material. The deepest part of that road cut is about four feet. That is not a deliberate road cut. That's a product of erosion. So there is another potential source of erosion on this uh, site. So 
What we want to do is, want, okay, let's look at this erosion and redeposition problem. Let's see if we can actually document it, even model it, or perhaps uh, develop a couple of models. So we dug a number of excavation units, one by one million units, around where we found the foundation. We've got one over here south of the road. The, 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 the driveway actually cuts right through the site. And then we have unit 11 over here next to our shovel test pits. And I'll draw your attention, don't mind this over here, just over here, some of our additional shovel test pits where we hit deep deposits is uh, unit 11. This is our reconstructed profile for down the hill across from the house. The red here is a buried A horizon. All this material above redeposited. So we wanted to look at that stratigraphy, not through a shovel test pit, which is rather difficult when it's going down four feet, and try doing an excavation unit. And what we were trying to figure out, you know, can we in fact demonstrate that we've got material coming from here and working its way down the hill? What we've done with our excavation units is, um, I should say, uh, Sarah Grady, who's giving a paper in another room right now, one of our citizen scientists at, uh, at CERC, uh, quantified the ceramics by weight. What was the average weight in a ceramic shirt from this group of units? from this group of units, and then from this unit here. And from that, she came up with these numbers, and really it's the bottom line that matters. Approximately 2.59 grams per uh, shirt uh, for the upper ones, 1.94, then 0.57. So there's a decrease in shirt size as you go down the hill. And it's uh, pretty strong evidence, I think, you know, supporting that model that material has been redeposited. So what we're coming up with down in Unit 11 is material from the site with the foundation. And here's our excavation unit, one by one meter, going down just over four feet. You need a bucket to get in and out. And we even put a shovel test pit in there, too, to see how much deeper we can go. But here you can see stratum 9 is a buried A horizon. It's actually a plowed horizon from which we recovered only aboriginal pottery, but it's plowed, so it's, you know, it's an historic surface. But all those lenses above it, redeposited material with bits of charcoal in it, every layer produced a couple of ceramic shirts and shirts of bottle glass, all of them absolutely consistent with those of the second quarter of the 19th century that we were, that we were recovering from uphill from around that foundation. Now the driveway cut through that site as well, so how much of this material is from the eroded driveway in the early 20th century? How much is of it is erosion from uh, where that foundation is, from its demolition? We can't tell at this point. But I think the key thing here for us, at least in Maryland, is that this is erosion and redeposition not because of agriculture. This is from use of the house lot. And that is a major issue in Maryland because you say erosion, uh, and, and, and nutrients flowing into the bay, and it's all about the farmers. And here's a case in point where this isn't from the farmers. This is from the use of a house lot. It's unfortunate we can't keep, couldn't have kept that unit open, because everybody who saw it, including, including geologists from the University of Maryland, were very impressed by it. Because think of it, you're standing on the edge of that unit. It's four feet deep. Your eyeballs are somewhere around five feet above. So you're looking down nine feet. They look really deep. Actually, look really deep when we're inside them too. And it's just a visual impression. It's a very striking impression on how much soil has been moved over a relatively short period of time. So we have these two competing models. Uh, from the purposes of uh, informing policy, it doesn't really matter which model is correct. I and mean, it's kind of there's academic interest to it, but the point is we've had all this soil loss and redeposition in a context that is not agricultural. So, what do we got? We've got extensive erosion of poor tobacco that is clearly due to agriculture. And it's agriculture that people at the time knew this was happening. This is in the late 18th century, even before the American Revolution. People saw soils coming down from the uplands, filling in the creek, basically choking off the port. They saw catastrophe on the horizon for their port town. 
So the, one of the questions we have there is, what did they do about it? And as far as we could tell at this point, what they did about it was absolutely nothing. This is a great thing for us to look at in a public context because we see this now, depleting uh, uh, oil reserves, uh, global warming, and all these sorts of issues. We see catastrophe on the horizon. What are we going to do about it? And will we deal with it in a timely manner? And the nice thing about poor tobacco is we could talk about this sort of thing in a sort of politically neutral setting because this happened over 200 years ago. It's not like talking about current problems. So we can get people to talk about what destroyed poor tobacco 200 years ago without all this invective and rhetoric. And we can talk about it fairly dispassionately. And it's very easy to get people interested in this history. Uh, at Selma's connection, now we do have you know, erosion, agricultural uh, erosion on the other side of the house. Uh, but here we're looking at everyday use of a house lot and the effects of that everyday use on erosion, the redeposition of that material, which we can demonstrate by looking at that fall off curve in artifact size. And we see not only the stuff on the surface that the four feet we dug through, but we could follow that down the hill and right down into what used to be a waterway, a creek which now flows with the water only after a significant rain. So here's a setting again where we can show people the effects of erosion and sedimentation on changing land surfaces. I like to bring folks to a spot and say, stand here right now. If you were here 200 years earlier, you would have been three feet high. That's how much soil has been lost. Step over here where you're standing now, the original ground surface, three feet deeper. Uh, so both of these uh, sites reveal deeply buried uh, soil horizons, and we're looking at soil loss and sedimentation. And this is just one facet of what we're doing at uh, Smithsonian. We're also looking at, well, when did people start burning coal around here? Because the campus is 2,650 acres of fields and forest. People looking around would wonder, why would you burn coal here? It's forested. You have all the fire what you need. But clearly, at some point, they decided to switch to coal. And that, bring, that raises questions. Well, why? Well, very likely because they burned off all of the wood that was suitable for firewood. So we're looking at a very significant change in the setting of uh, the campus. I'll take people out in back of the Selman house, look across that field. By the way, right now we're working on a 1660 site right over here. Uh, but I can, you know, it looks very idyllic. It's beautiful. And I point out, well, you see all those cuts in that road? That's all a product of erosion. A lot of that is from mechanical plowing, probably 1930s, 1940s. So here's a place where we can bring people and talk about how humans have manifestly altered the environment, the ecosystems, choking off streams, introducing new species, extirpating other species. Uh, and it has a very direct impact on them. Now our, our challenges are how do we teach not only the public and legislators about this process, but about our fellow scientists. There are 18 labs at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. The archaeology one is the most recent one. We're number 18. Most of the scientists on campus don't know what we're doing. And in fact, when we were digging out in front of the house, right in front of the main road that they'd all take to the main part of the campus where they'd work, they'd all drive by. None of them would ever stop and ask a question. The only people who'd come and ask us questions would be the security people, which is, I mean, which gives you an idea of the kind of challenge we face in getting this kind of, uh, these ideas across. Um, we also, let's face it, we need to offer some sort of solutions. How do we deal with these sorts of issues? about loss of soil and redeposition, uh, as well as you know, consuming resources. And then finally, I think it's a great thing to be able to take out at least small groups of people out into the wild and teach them how to read the landscape. Actually, it's a challenge enough teaching our young archaeological technicians how to do this, this important part of the field work we do. 
how do you read the landscape and how do you read human activities into that landscape? It's a slow process educating people, uh, but it really is necessary if we're going to influ influence public policy. This isn't just about gratification of scholars learning new things. It's about sharing what we've learned. It's about doing relevant research that can have a positive effect. If we adopted this sort of approach, if the scientists had done so 20, 30 years ago, we might be in a different uh, point right now in terms of uh, global environmental change. We waited too long. It's only in this past, past year that the scientific community has finally been talking about how are we going to help people adapt to these changes. We're no longer talking about how to stop them because that's all, that, that, that ship has sailed. So now we've shifted sort of subtly over into how are we going to prepare people to deal with the changes. And we shouldn't be in that position, and yet that's where we are today. So I think this is an approach that's going to work out well at Smithsonian. We're going to be doing a lot more. We've only been at this for two years, so uh, just follow and see what we're up to. Thank you.